We're moving now from the context of the Dutch National Archive of Sound and Vision to the context of Brighton uh, Design Archives. And Sue Greco will explore with us some of the issues about the tension between, say, archive as a place and archive as a concept, the theory and the practice of this. And I'm very excited to hear your contribution. So welcome. Thank you. And thank you to Irina for inviting me to be with you today. It's been a really exciting day so far, um, lots of questions, lots of um, really exciting stuff that we've seen. And I was struck by Irina's opening point about the importance of looking at the past when we're thinking about the future, because that's, those are the kind of conversations that I'm having all the time, and in a way that's what I'm talking about today. Um, Johan's paper was great too, um, looking at some of the same issues that I'm going to be talking about, but from a different perspective. So if you've still got your sort of bot brains on, you might spot some of those same terms Sort of coming through, but some of them might be represented in different ways, and that's kind of what I'm talking about today. Um, and I'm going to take us back inside the institution, rather, in comparison with what Johan was talking about. Um, as um, Shiloh introduced me, I'm the archivist and senior research fellow at the Design Archives at the University of Brighton. And um, before I came to higher education about eight years ago, I worked in national museums um, for a long time, so I was the archivist at the Tate Archive in London and at the Imperial War Museum. Um, but all that time I've been working with, with visual arts archives. And where I work now, what I particularly enjoy is that we reflect on those um, practices of stewardship. Um, we use the phrase research-informed stewardship quite a lot. And I was particularly uh, pleased to be invited to this event because it's very much in that spirit that I like to work, that's opening up conversations between different perspectives um, on the field of the archive. So what I hope I can contribute to this event is I am an archivist, some of you were trying that out before lunch, um, may or may not be quite how um, I experience it, but I think a lot of those important principles are there. And what I want to talk about today comes out of some ongoing research about the materiality of archives and um, about archival selection. Um, materiality is obviously particularly pertinent to think about in connection with um, moving more into digital archives. I'm looking at some examples of the ways that the material bodies of archives express themselves, are characterised and encountered, and also at the triangulated relationship that the viewer can find themselves in between the creator and the archive itself. So today I'll talk about some of the things that are distinctive about archives and about archival theory and practice. I'm not working at this point with more digital records, um, but archivists need to be part of that, that place where the memory of the future is going to be saved or lost, as we've been hearing. What I'll do today is share with you some ideas about archives and archival principles in the analogue world and a few thoughts about how they will move into the future. So it's a kind of reminder of where we've come from so that new shapings and understandings of the archive can remember the best of the old world. Okay. So over the last 20 years, the archive has been transformed from the realm primarily of the archivist and historian to a place of public and academic consciousness. I say the archivist and historian and these um, rather unlikely looking teenage visitors to a local archive in 1980. <laughs> the curatorial turn, the archival turn, the material turn and the effective turn have all made inroads into the archival consciousness as well as shaping views on the archive from outside. A generation or more of artists have used the archive as a fertile source for creative practice and interrogated its significance as a site of meaning making. In the process, a conceptual gap has developed between the archive, I always have to do that, say that, as a critical concept, a social construct, and archives, the places and collections where those archivists and historians worked. Many of the more philosophical writings about the notional archive have not considered archive theory, or even in some cases acknowledged its existence. Archival scholars such as Michelle Caswell and Laura Miller have argued that not only the labour of archivists, but also their knowledge and skills are easily made invisible. At the very least, there are certain key principles from archive theory which are important to understand when working with archives of whatever kind. Context is a cornerstone of archive theory. Archival texts and objects do not exist in isolation, but as a body of component parts whose sum is greater than those parts. The parts converse with one another. Their meaning is contingent on each other and on things outside that body of material. The context of their production the function they perform in their creator's life or in communication with others, their retention in some kind of filing system or not, the ways in which they are understood or interpreted, whether by archivists or researchers, their placing in an institution which has its own collecting subjectivities. 
All these affect the encounter with the archive. Talking of visual arts archives in particular, Joan Schwartz explains that, quote, context is seminal for understanding the ways in which visual materials function as documents and participate in the processes of meaning making. The understanding of one part is richest when it takes account of its place in a larger body of material. These dis this distinct character is apparent from the first moment of encounter with the body of an archive. For an archivist, that's often when the material is being offered for acquisition. We get a sense of the identity of an archive, not just the characteristics of the person who created it, but a distinct identity of the material itself, with all its quirks, emphases and silences. So here's some examples of, um, of me going to see different collections in situ. That one kind of looks relatively organised. This one a bit less so, lots of things in filing cabinets. And this one I didn't actually see, thank goodness, it looks like this. <laughs> For me, working with archives of creative practice, the archive is where we see the labour that produces the work. This is where a creative life and work is made visible. The American beat writers were very conscious of their archives and their significance. William Burroughs said, in a sense, sorry, quote, in a sense, all my books are one book. It's just a continuous book. And drawing on this idea, I'm suggesting that we think of the archive, especially the archive of an individual, as one text, a continuous body of the work of a life. So to explore this a bit more, I want to look at the archive of the painter Prunella Clough, which is held at Tate Archive in London. Alongside letters, diaries, portrait photographs and the like, the archive contains a body of material relating to her creative process, which is extraordinary in that it's not preparatory material for works in the sense that a conventional sketchbook or notebook might be. It belongs to an earlier stage in the process, an archive of thoughts, of ideas, a record of noticing, which becomes the raw material of creative production. From a body of text notes, photographs, colour samples, she selects a combination which will make a work. The notes are highly selective, distilled and vivid, word sketches and abstraction in words. They are the bricolage that any researcher practices. Her photographs, while having a documentary function, are often as much about composition and the relationships between things. She carefully frames a complex intersection of, life, of line and plane, the depth of field from perhaps a wire fence at the front, to the flat expanse of a cooling tower, wires passing overhead and the Meccano-like structure of a crane. Colour is often particularly mentioned, as well as textures. Viewed together, and only if viewed together, they begin to build a sense of the evolution of ideas, not to specific works, but to a working method, and to the way an image evolves and is put together. So here you can see a couple of those photographs, some of her notes. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to read them but they're kind of quite abbreviated, um, quite abbreviated words. Here she's writing about gas works, which is what obviously these are photographs of. Um, and here are some of the, the paintings of the same subject. Um, and another example, she's very interested in hearing things that may pass unnoticed by other people, so just cheap goods at a market. And you can see how she's extracting um, some forms from that. And again, this, oops, one way. Here's some examples of the way those kind of things come out in, in her later paintings. So in this way, the archive is, as I've written, a kind of primordial soup, the place of origin from which sources combine to make new creative life. They're a natural product of Clough's creative process, but also a resource for her future use. The poet Stephen Spender wrote that, quote, the imagination is an exercise of memory, and Clough uses the archive as a prompt for that exercise. We find the trace, but we cannot access the memory it triggered its function for her, so th something of its origin will always elude us, but we can capture a subtle sense of something. These creative components of Clough's archive operate as a body of material always waiting to be turned into something else, in a perpetual state of possibility, of turning, quote, belatedness into becomingness, to use the words of Hal Foster, writing on an archival impulse in art. It's this potentiality that is one of the seductions of the archive. So as we see with Clough, something that is particular about the archival object is that it has a physical, intellectual and causal relationship with the other stuff that came from the same place. They relate to different parts, moments, transactions of the same life. A relationship formed not just by this shared provenance, but by the meaningful dialogue inherent in that provenance. The different parts refer and relate to one another, explain and answer one another, or even contradict and fail to answer each other. It's the difference between this poster um, by Arnold Rothholz. Um, on the left, you can see 
um, a study for it, which we have in the archive, in Rothholz's archive, which we hold. And on the right is the finished poster. And of course, when you see them here on the screen next to each other, they look very similar in terms of um, scale. But in actual fact, the original drawing is, is this size, and the, the poster is this size. Um, so there's sort of two points here. One is just about how different those things look digitally and what is lost in the representation um, in, in the digital <coughs> format there. Um, and the other is about the meaning of the Rothholz poster if it's viewed in, for example, the collection of the Imperial War Museum, which has a collection of posters from that period, and when it's seen in the context of Rothholz's own archive, where you can see the finished poster alongside the design and other um, aspects of Rothholz's life at the time. So in this way, an archive has a system which is represented materially, and engaging with this system accesses an enhanced body of information or of knowledge. So my point here is about the, um, the value of recalling this historiography as we go into the archive of the future. And that's, it's a slight dis digression, but it's worth saying something perhaps about the meaning of terminology, um, which can sometimes become problematic. The distinctions between archives and collections, a collection has a very different kind of system than the one I've just described. Um, a collection system is based on the collector or collecting body's act of collecting and the social or cultural environment um, that they operate within, whereas the archive has this originary life-based system and then moves into later multiple systems of use and interpretation by the creator, perhaps, in the case of Clough, by later custodians and by multiple researchers of all kinds. And if an archive is broken up and its components parts dispersed, for example, to other collections, then that original meaning may be lost in the process of acquiring a new collection-based meaning. Does it matter that archive is being used in all these other ways now? I'm not saying that it, that it matters, I just think it's important that we remember um, the particular meaning that um, archivists may use so that we understand the implications of, of the choices that we make. It may be in part because of the, the common conflation of these terms, collection and archive, that the system of the archive is little considered outside the discipline of archival studies, although that is changing more and more now. The material impression, the encounter with this system, is part of the encounter of the archive, what happens when we spend time with an archive, quite simply. What Marianne Diva calls, quote, the work of the archive. The French scholar Arlette Farge, talking of her encounters with large accumulations of French state archives and the individual stories that emerge through these um, major official documents, she describes the sheer mass of the archive, what we might call its material scale, as, quote, excessive and overwhelming, like a spring tide, an avalanche or a flood. In a way, I think we got a little sense of that just from that exercise we did this morning about how, how material builds up and how intimidating it can become. And I'll just remind you of that slide I showed earlier. <laughs> One of the ways in which the problematic of this mass is tackled is through selective digitization. Um, so to continue with the, um, the Clough archive, a selection of that material has been digitized as part of a major take digitization program. So this is the sort of introductory page to the, to the project. And this is some of those photographs as they appear. Here they appear almost like a, a flat file image library. The connections between the, the different images aren't necessarily represented here. Many writings about the material presence or presentness of the archive take a binary approach, considering it primarily in relation to the alternative digital versions. Materiality is one of the characteristics most affected through this process, and thus one where the effect of the archive comes most into the fore. The digital has expanded the definition of the archive and therefore debates about what constitutes and governs the archive in the digital environment, with its promise of liberation from traditional concepts of archives and the archival, their functions and malleability. Conversely, in other discourses, digital materiality complicates ideas of the original and the authentic, the aura and the allure of the archive. The question of context within that larger body of material becomes even more problem problematic in digital context. What we often see are digital collections, though calling them digital archives may confer greater currency. Joanna Sassoon and others have articulated a widespread concern that digitization may encourage this shift from, quote, context to content. The way we move through these digital materials is fundamentally different. They're largely removed from their system or attached only by a long and often hidden tether, which needs careful tra tracing to its source. Um, if you want to find out that source, I'll pick this up again a bit later. Curatorial agencies involved not only in the selection of which images are digitised, but also in their removal from that original context. 
not only in the separation from the material qualities of the original, but also in the way these material qualities are represented in the metadata, which effectively controls what the viewer is allowed to know about the size, the condition, the content of the original. In all these ways, digitation, digitization acts as a form of mediation between user and archive, a process through which primary source material effectively becomes secondary. Jasmine Burns talks of, quote, content-based digital orphans without context and therefore without evidentiary value. Digital surrogates are ill-equipped to represent the effective or material presence of the creator. As researchers, we often collude with the notion that the encounter with the archive brings us to the presence of the creator through the physical manifestation of things they touched, made, or otherwise brought into being. It can seem to bring us to a moment in the past which, Diva says, quote, generates that longed-for sense of intimacy with our research subjects. There's a triangulation of this relationship between archive, its creator, and user. There are ways in which the creator, though no longer present in the flesh, may take an active part in these ongoing discourses, retaining some kind of material presence in the archive, but offers a prosthetic version of his life, yet has its own separate identity of form, representation, and evidence. Seemingly aware of the future uses of the archive, beyond their control, the creator may attempt to exert an influence over its engagements, interceding for certain material, telling us what's important, projecting an archival consciousness through a material layer of encounter which appears at unpredictable places within the overall mass. This is the context of the text, or the content, of the archive, disrupting the subjective encounter between viewer and archive. These interjections might be manifested by implication, for example through privileging the retention of certain kinds of records over others, which is nevertheless a pretty emphatic way of shaping what future narratives are possible, or through a chaotic resistance to order, and thus to the process of archivalization. Or it might be more explicit through physical annotations and commentaries forming a direct communication with our present. Um, and so, to go back to one of the examples I showed you earlier, the, um, the archive with the, the filing cabinets. When you look in the filing cabinets, we kept finding these little notes everywhere. Look in every folder and file. Look in all folders. There's a kind of anxiety to them, um, often underlined, sometimes exclamation marks, sorry. Um, they're like exhortations and appeals to people who are coming after, suggesting an awareness of the archive as a separate entity with a future beyond the designer's own. The studio of this particular designer was an entirely private space where the, even the designer's wife didn't visit until after his death. And there's a sense of his awareness that such a visit awaits somewhere in the future. Some eyes are going to come and look. We might infer anxiety and a sense of urgency in these instructions left in an archive that no one really knew about, an attempt to keep some control over its mass. They're also an assertion of the importance of the whole archival body, the importance of assessing it all before embarking on the interpretation of any part of it. It's quite a responsibility. Perhaps there's a sense of being excluded from the future independent life of that archive, from what the archive will say when the creator is gone and can no longer control its tongue. The artist Susan Hiller explains her process of working with collections thus, Quote, the materials that attract me are the ones that seem to have a lot to say, and I collaborate with them to say it. Uh, the University of Brighton Design Archives also holds the archive of Theo Crosby, who is an architect, sculptor, writer, and designer. Um, he did some work in Amsterdam as well, in fact, at the, um, was it the NMB Bank building? Um, Crosby's archive is patchy in its coverage, representing his practice across its range, art, writing, and architecture, and across about 50 years of time. There are dense secretions of material from particular moments or projects, including a wonderful series of um, pocketbooks, if this is an example, and um, major silences about other projects. And a, a similar kind of example from his archive is here. He's designating a file of papers with this annotation, all very old, 1980, one might say very dead. He asserts his authority over these expired papers, which nevertheless, like the message itself, managed to outlive him, and which he was aware might have a material lifespan beyond his own. Although dismissing the file beyond its original purpose, he didn't actually go so far as to remove it, although he laid down that marker. The threat of destruction wasn't implemented. And that's the kind of chance thing that, that can um, say what is left for the future to interrogate. The folder is, of course, full of things which are anything but dead to a future researcher and may offer potentially fruitful encounters, correspondence about book reviews or after-dinner speeches, 
including one which argues for the material potential of buildings beyond their originary life, in a kind of echo of the file subject matter. And then my, my final example is the archive of the graphic and information designer FHK Henrian, um, which is large and rich in visual materials. He was an emigre from Germany before the Second World War, and he started his graphic career in poster design, helped to shape first the emergence of the profession of <coughs> consultant designer, and subsequently the establishment of corporate identity design as a coordinated discipline. Um, and when I flew over here yesterday, I saw lots of planes bearing the KLM logo that he was responsible for, which has sort of stayed unchanged. Um, there are a number of major um, logos of that kind that he worked on. He also did some posters for the Dutch government in exile during the Second World War. Henrion's archive prioritises and privileges the visual, organised in these striking boxes, which are part of it, which are at the heart of his archive. There are also photographs in many formats, talks and writings, which also indicate his status and interests, and all kinds of other material, of which these are just a few examples. This is an exhibition that he did um, during the Second World War, sort of encouraging people to grow more food of their own and, and keep rabbits for meat. Um, some of his... Um, editorial and um, advertising designs, some book covers and so on. There's little documentation though about these commissions or the creative or administrative exchanges that led to these visual outputs, so this correspondence where he might have been invited to do it, what the terms were, um, how the process worked out, was it smooth or complicated. In the construction of this archive, the work, both in process and complete, of a practitioner in visual communication is left to speak for itself largely without that documentation, thus rendering the archive more monumental, a demonstration of career, prestige and achievement, a narrative of success. But there are cracks and fragmentary survivals that somehow come through of person, personal, more vulnerable moments, moments from which his life might have taken a very different course. So as, for example, this photograph, which dates from just before his journey to Paris in 1933, which is a very different image from other photographs in the archive which present him here as the um, highly successful um, and high-status designer. So all this, even the boxes, is part of the evidentiary materiality of this archive. Its inclusions and omissions, part of Henry's project to not only document but to narrate and classify his own life and work through the archive. If we look only at the materiality of component parts or of decontextualised objects, be they text or visual, we lose a great deal. To return to Burroughs, Harris argues that as well as the archive being the source of multiple readings, each book that comes out of the archive is itself radically plural. The preservation of the original characteristics of the body of the archive seems to be a way for the archive to retain that radical plurality in the experiences not only of the creator, but of all those who encounter it subsequently, and in the face of the material contingencies of research and interpretation. It is through the maintenance of this plurality that other possibilities remain open, and the infinite future interpretations of the digital environment and engagements there become possible. So how do we carry these characteristics of the analogue archive to the future as we move our lives into the digital, when self-documentation and the very processes that created these archives are very different? There's um, a greater conscious observance of the self through the eyes of others in the way we live now, manifesting and creating more overt self-consciousness of the archive that's building up. There's a sense that if something isn't documented and shared, it didn't happen. And so documentation has acquired a new significance because sharing is the purpose, rather than the byproduct of capturing a memory. Online lives may be very carefully curated to present the best impression. The audience of our communications has grown wider, not simply a letter to a friend now, but a message written to be seen by anyone else who may be looking. In short, there's an increased awareness of the present and future viewer. Looking at paper-based archives, the Holy Grail is sometimes the early scrap of paper that may have captured a developing idea when it was born. The private creative gesture before it was pre presented for public consumption, be it the artwork or the curatorial concept, that unselfconscious moment. And I wonder if sometimes it's the moment when no one is watching that tells us the truth about ourselves, institutionally and individually. What happens to this in the era of the more self-conscious archive? While curating our lives online, we may not want the unselfconscious <coughs> moments to be revealed, even though we want to see them about others. And at the same time, there's another story to be told. The data that is captured unconsciously, and that may undermine the stories as we tell them ourselves. Researchers draw on big data sources such as records of internet searches through which some of the ways we really live and think as a society are made visible. The data scientist Seth Stevens Davidovitz describes such sources as a digital truth serum. And on a more macro level, the quantified self movement uses logging and tracking technologies to record data about the individual's life, 
bodily functions and activities. That these are questions that will unfold into the future. What we keep and how, generating, building and curating archives, individual and institutional, are human activities which bridge the analogue digital shift, but the ways that they work are in a continual process of change. There are whole new disciplinary fields working in archival areas, data curation, media archaeology, um, web archaeology, as, as we saw earlier on today, as well as wider information technology which underpins all the ways we live and assumes it is potentially responsible for everything. New ideas are going to come from collaboration, as we've seen this morning, called for by many archival scholars, including Laura Miller, and it will come not from um, a, 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 an unenlightened critique of other camps, but from embracing new ideas, from marriages between different kinds of specialist tools and principles, and that's certainly what archivists need to be ready and prepared to take part, of, part in. At a more academic level, I've seen great examples of small-scale projects which provide tailored solutions to opening up archives for, for access for research. How do we marry these idiosyncratic projects with global initiatives for information and data exchange and sharing? Laura Miller also points out that the future archive is not one magic bullet that will solve everything. It's a multi-layered, continuous evolution. Archives may become decentralised, they may become post-custodial, in that the archival institution may not even exist in the same way. Um, okay, I'll just hurry on with these last bits, I'm conscious of time. So an illustration of the kind of importance of the involvement of these archival principles I've been talking about is Pinterest. And I'm talking from quite a personal point of view here. It's a wonderful source of visual materials, but as a researcher, I find it incredibly frustrating because by its very nature, um, it sort of under undermines the principle of um, citation or saying where an image has come from, because so often you find a really great image you want to use, but you, you don't know where it came from. Does this matter? To me, both as an archivist and an academic, it does. Um, to the average person collecting images for their pin board, of course, it may not at all. So my point here again is that it's important to understand what we are looking at, um, where it may have come from, and the kind of questions we need to ask around it. Um, and I'll just end with this slide that has a sort of slightly prescient quality to it. It's in this rather old document that we have in the archive, which materially is degrading because of this rusty pin. And there's just this intriguing little reference to pocket and computer on it. <laughs> and what's the provenance? Sorry? You were just talking about Pinterest losing references. Yeah, Where I know. And you know what? From? I can't actually remember where this one came from. <laughs> <laughs> but my colleague will because I got it from her. I said, oh, that's an amazing image. But that's, yeah, so that illustrates exactly my point. Thank you so much. Um, we have a little bit of time for questions. Um, maybe I'll, I'll kick off looking at your um, uh, work on the self-conscious and the unselfconscious creation of, yes. of archives. I was wondering um, how you would reflect from your experience on um, this, this uh, I guess the attempt of the, the artist in this case to sort of curate how they will be archived mm. and how you deal with that as mm. an archivist. I don't, I don't think there's probably much that we can do about it. I mm. think the key is going to be understanding what has happened to that material. I don't, I don't know if the same thing's true here, but in Britain a lot of artists are now employing their own archivists. Mm -hmm so that they kind of retain some of that control over what is retained and what isn't, because they are more conscious of not only the sort of financial value of their archives, but how important they are for how they will be perceived in the future. So they are wanting to do more of the storytelling through their archive. Yeah, to have some sort of control. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, looks like you love your job. I do. What, <laughs> what is the most exciting thing about the archives? From your personal point of view? Um, oh gosh, what is the most exciting? I just enjoy taking... The way I describe it sometimes to people is I kind of just take a bit of a walk in the past every day. I love that sort of direct engagement. I love that moment of encounter with the physical material. And that's why these questions about how different it is working with the digital, whether it's born digital or um, digitised material, they do raise such different questions. And I suppose... Behind my interest in this lies my wondering what my job is going to become over over a period of time because I do I love working with the material and just as I imagine it's the same here just as lots of people are now going back to vinyl records and 
um, you know, analogue in other areas of their lives. I kind of wonder how that is eventually maybe going to play out here as well. Certainly a lot of those same questions are, are, um, are at play. Working with students, um, because they work digitally in design, they don't have a sort of physical object that they're creating. It's overwritten all the time. And if they don't capture those changes as they make it, then no one will know what the creative process was involved there. But capturing those stages involves um, an awful lot of, of work and, and, and technology. I've sort of gone off from answering your question there, haven't I? <laughs> but I, I think it's just that direct encounter with the material. And it's hard to give that to everybody because archives can't operate on that scale. And digital versions can offer some of that, but it's just being aware of what is lost in, in that process. And that's kind of the, the bind we have really. So it's, it's, it's interesting, it's, it's lovely to see your, your passion about this and also when you say taking a walk in the past, then I wonder then, uh, besides the maybe the changing role of the material you're working with and the, the role of uh, an archivist in this, if you look at the future of, of memory, you, you touched on some um, different strategies, and I call them marriages between tools. Yes. As something you mentioned, and I was curious what you meant by marriages between tools. Well, I think the kind of things that Yohan was talking about this morning are exactly that kind of thing. We can't answer all those questions on our own, and nor should we be answering all those questions on our own, because it just isn't the same, that environment isn't the same anymore. There are people who have other kinds of skills that we need to work with. Um, so, you know, I've seen people working on very particular archives, like a, there was an archive of um, an experimental music collective with that, that I looked at when I was at the Tate, and they've done this incredibly detailed um, database that had these very specialized tools for retrieving particular kinds of information from it. It was amazing. But archives which are operating from um, a motive of the kind of interoperability and the sharing of data, they need to have something a bit more flattening. Uh, it's, interface, it's yeah, interface. So it's, yeah. it's, it's interesting to see how those debates will develop between the impulse to create a, a custom solution for a very uh, particular purpose and then those, those requirements to sort of share and aggregate large bodies of, of data through an interface. So last last press, urgent pressing question? Yes. Yeah, but I, I think you touched very clearly upon this, this conundrum of how can you, um, let's say, safeguard the understanding of context and the body of the archive while uh, dissemination, as Johan mentioned, dissemination, yeah. interaction, uh, reuse and sampling yes. is something that you would like to encourage. Absolutely. So how yeah. do you keep those two together? Well, I guess my point is really that it's important to capture that original form of it, the original shape of it. So through that process of digitization, you're creating something else that you then set free for all those mm -hmm. multiple uses. And the point is just to be able to go back, to follow those traces, to look at its, what its original context was, if you need it, because not everybody will. Some people will just want you know, individual parts of it to reuse for something else, and that's fine, that's great, just as it should be. But it's just remembering that there is an original story there that, that can be important too. Just a little follow-up. You, you mm -hmm. seem to be upholding this distinction between analog material and digital immaterial. Do I understand you correctly on this? What, the digital is immaterial? Yes. No, I don't okay. think that. No, okay. it's just a different kind of materiality. Can you yeah. comment briefly on what the oh, materiality is? Well, I am, you know, I work much more with the analog, as you probably gathered. Um, and, you know, Johan has, has been talking much more about sort of um, the digital side of things, but as an analog person, then, yeah. what would you comment on the digital? Um, I suppose I've been talking to him does about the rush? things that are lost in that. Person. Well, it, well, yeah. it does because if you don't, if you don't preserve it, it will degrade just in different ways. I think there's enough. There are. I think there are certain ideas that are sometimes perpetuated that are not correct about digital, which is that it will last forever and that everything is there, and neither of those things are true, but it can too easily seem like a solution, let's digitise everything, which anyone who works in an archive will have heard lots of times, as if that's a sort of quick thing to do, um, which it isn't. But also you have to keep migrating things and, and testing them in various ways, or, or they're not going to survive, as again, it's just right. sure there's no need. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like another round.